I hate roller coasters. I just do. Romans chapters 1 through 5 have been a roller coaster. Paul has taken you and me to the heights of God's mercy. He's plunged us into the depths of human depravity. And there's been all kinds of sharp bank turns in between. Sometimes roller coasters make people sick. Perhaps this Romans roller coaster we've been on has made some of us sin sick. Did you know that back in the 14th century, the Black Plague killed between 75 and 200 million people? That's 30 to 60 percent of the entire population of Europe at that time. I was once in the office of a cemetery in Baltimore getting ready to do a graveside service, and on the wall were some old black and white photographs from the early 20th century, and one caught my eye in particular. It was a flatbed rail car with bodies stacked on top of it, and I said, what is that? And they said, oh, that was the flu epidemic of 1918. The whole city of Baltimore was quarantined for weeks, and no one could go out, and people were dying throughout the day, and if you lo your loved one died, you took them down and put them out on the street, and throughout the day, trucks were roaming the streets of Baltimore, picking up the bodies, taking them to the train station, and they'd actually built a track out to the cemetery. They'd put the bodies in the flatbed carts, take them out there, and then they dug mass graves and dumped the bodies in. 25% of the American population was infected during the 1918 flu epidemic, and more people died than in World War I. Well, this morning in the text before us, the Apostle Paul introduces you and me to an epidemic of pandemic proportions, an epidemic that has infected the entire human race, and the mortality rate is 100%. Let's see what he's talking about. I invite you to turn with me as we continue our sermon series going straight through Romans to Romans chapter 5. We look this morning at verses 12 through 17. Please pray with me before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word, that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Hear God's word now to you and me, beginning to read at verse 12 of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not accounted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If this proves effective, this is a game changer. Those are the words of Dr. Margaret Chan of the World Health Organization, commenting on a new Ebola vaccine that has been developed in Canada. They put this vaccine into practice in the lives of 7,500 people who had been exposed to the Ebola virus. 
4,000 of those 7,500 received the vaccine within 10 days of exposure, and not one of those 4,000 got Ebola. The other 3,500 received the vaccine 10 days or more after exposure, and even then, only 16 of that 3,500 contracted the disease. Medical researchers are ecstatic that they may have come across a game changer that's going to eradicate Ebola epidemics across the globe. In verse 12 of our text today, Paul says that Adam, as in Adam and Eve, unleashed an epidemic of pandemic proportions that's never be, the likes of which have never been seen before or since. It's, in, 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 it's an infected the entire human race, and the mortality rate is 100%. And this endemic, this disease of pandemic proportion is sin. Uh-oh, here he goes again, talking about sin. Oh, Ron, come on, give me a break. We don't like to talk about sin, do we? We don't like hearing about it. So mostly we don't. And when we don't talk about it, and then all we do is encourage its spread. 45 years ago, Presbyterian psychiatrist Carl Menninger of the Menninger Clinic wrote a book about this reluctance you and I have talking about sin. He entitled it, Whatever Became of Sin. When you and I don't own up to it and name it and understand the severity uh, and the depth of human sin, it puts us in danger of possibly missing the cure, even missing eternal life. Now, at first glance, these verses before us this morning uh, seem, this argument of Paul seems to me be kind of convoluted and, and complex and confusing. But don't let that belie the fact that Paul here writes with mathematical precision. Let me reduce his argument to just one sentence. Here's what he's saying. Through Adam's sin, all humanity became sinners and alienated from God. But through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, all who are in Christ become righteous and restored into right relationship with God. You see, in the sin pandemic, Adam is both infected, and he's the infector, and in the sin pandemic, Jesus Christ is both the great physician, and he is the cure, the only cure. Now, in verses 15 through 17 of our text, what Paul does is he actually sets up Adam over and against Jesus, the second Adam, as antitypes of each other. But first, a word about the historicity of Adam. Was there actually a first human being named Adam? Or is the Adam and Eve saga that we find in Genesis better relegated to the category of myth or symbol? I believe the historic Adam for three reasons. First of all, because genealogies in Scripture treat Adam as an historic figure. Now, you need to know that the Hebrews were obsessively, compulsively meticulous about their historical genealogies. Secondly, I believe Adam was an historic figure because Jesus says he was. He was the first parent of all humanity. And when Jesus speaks, I listen. Thirdly, geneticists today, those geneticists who trace human DNA throughout history are saying that it looks like it's possible to trace the whole human race down to one single individual. My goodness, could the Bible actually be true? But what about this business of the sin of one man, Adam, infecting you and me? I mean, how is that possible? You know, that's a, a, a good 21st century North American individualistic question. 
It's a question the Hebrews would have never raised. It's a question that's not raised probably in most societies today that are more corporate and communal rather than individualistic. Even today, talk to somebody that's in a tribal society and ask them their, ask them their name, they're more likely to tell you their tribal name first. See, for the Hebrews, their thinking was that this Adam, um, you know, there's a mystery here. There's a mystery here. We'll never resolve it, but what we can say is that apparently in Adam, there is such a complete solidarity that God creates between him and the entire human race that when Adam falls, the entire race falls with him. There's a familial solidarity there. Um, that's clearly what Scripture teaches. We Presbyterians call that total depravity, which does not mean that everyone and everything is totally bad. What it means is this, that there's not one piece of human existence, not one person that hasn't been tainted to some extent by sin. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr put it this way, even in our best deeds, we still sin. We still sin. But now look at verses 15 through 17, how, how Paul plays Adam off of Jesus as antitypes of one another. He says, in Adam, you've got one man, one man, and through him, the entire human race is infected with sin. But in Jesus, you've got one man who brings the cure, not to all, Paul says to many. He does bring it to all who are in Christ. In Adam, you've got this one man whose one trespass has led to condemnation and judgment for all of humanity. But in Jesus, you've got one man who has taken the entire sin of the world upon himself, and the result for those who are in Christ is justification. Now, what does that mean? We've talked about that already. Remember, it just means we are now in Christ justified before the bar of God's perfect just justice. We no longer need to fear judgment or condemnation. Justified, just as if I, just as if I'd never sinned. In Adam, you have one man whose sin has caused death to reign. But Paul says, in Jesus, that's countered by one man who through death brings life, even eternal life. So you've got this juxtaposition, or juxtaposition, I mean, between Adam and Jesus, which means simply that in human existence there are really only two categories of people. There are those whose destiny is linked to their solidarity to Adam, and there are those whose destiny is linked to their solidarity with Jesus Christ, and the two are only separated by a gift, a gift of grace. Let's say that you just got bit by a rattlesnake, and I've got the antidote, and I care for you. I, I love you. I, I want to see you get well. I gladly give you the antidote, free of charge. I put it there. Now, a, a gift. The purpose of a gift is only achieved if the gift is received, embraced, in this case, taken. If you say to me, Ron, I have studied the chemical composition of rattlesnake venom antidote. I know that will work, and I'm really grateful to you for giving me that. And then you just sit there, leave the bottle on the table, you never take it. You're eventually going to die. The late, great Scottish Presbyterian pastor, theologian James Stewart, said the text that's before us this morning is the centerpiece of the gospel of grace. Because it says, he says, it brings to the surface what's called union with Christ. That in yours and my 
daily battle with this dis-ease called sin. It's only when you and I come to the great physician and embrace the great physician and receive his antidote, um, an antidote that's every drop which has been wrung out through a perfect sacrifice on a cross and become one with Christ, it's then that this cure, this antidote who is Jesus diffuses, dilutes, renders totally impotent all of the eternally deadly effects of our union with Adam. And that's replaced, trumped by our union with Christ. As you and I do daily battle with the sin, there's only one place to look for the cure. Back during World War I, a British lieutenant was leading his platoon back toward the front lines. They'd already been there once. They'd already been in the trenches. They'd already been in the mud. They'd seen their friends blown apart and killed. They'd been in the midst of the blood and the gore, and they did not want to go back. They were terrorized. They were gripped with fear. Despair reigned in their hearts. They were slumped over, heads down, shoulders stooped. They were not marching. At best, they were trudging. At worst, they were shuffling including their lieutenant. And out of the corner of his eyes, out of the corner of his eyes, something caught the lieutenant's attention. It was, it was a church that had been bombed out, and yet, miraculously, only one wall still stood. It was the wall behind the altar, and on that wall was a figure of the risen Christ. Now, this lieutenant was a Christian, and he began to look at that figure of Christ and he began to think about who Jesus is and what he had done for him. He began to think about the fact that through the life, death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus, um, something's been done for him that he could not do for himself. He began to remember that he'd given his life to Christ, that he was one with Christ, and that meant that nothing, nothing could separate him from the love of God, not even if he were to die on the front lines. And he found his spirit lift. He, he found courage welling up inside him, and so he barked an order. Eyes right. Suddenly, every head in his platoon came up and turned. And as those soldiers shuffled by that bombed-out church, all of them gazed upon the figure of the risen Jesus. And suddenly their shoulders began to straighten. They began to stand upright and they stopped shuffling. They began to march double time into the fray. When you and I do daily battle with sin, remember we do so. Illumined by the blaze of the glory of the gospel of grace. And those famous words of Winston Churchill, never have so many owed so much to so few, become for you and me, never have so many owed so much to just one. One man. The God man. The great physician. Dr. Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.